Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. My name is Shana Terrell. I am the Director of Pipeline Programming at the Center for Black Educator Development, hailing from the South South Bronx that raised me and been out in these Philadelphia streets that made me. So always made a shout out. Today, I would like to give a special shout out to all the teachers around the world. I know some of you have already been back at work and in the fine grind. A lot of our teacher friends are going back to work today, stepping foot in a building. And I just want to send y'all all light and love and let you know to be encouraged. I know with this past year and everything that has went on and happened with the pandemic and all that craziness, I know that sometimes it gets hard. But know that our children need you. Our families need you. Our communities need you. And thank you so much for the work that we do. And um, shout out to any parents and families out there watching that spirit of community and unity that you held on to during the pandemic. Please continue that because our teachers need to feel supported. They need to feel loved. And most of all, they need to be encouraged. So thank you. And Citizens Ed and the Center for Black Educated Development, a major thank you for creating this platform where we can talk to real people in a real struggle doing the real work. So today's theme, Black Male Voices Building a Black Educator Pipeline, the topic, We Need Black Male Educators. So I'd like to introduce my today's guest, super excited about him coming on today. So Curtis Valentine is co-director of the Progressive Policy Institute Reinventing America's School Project. Curtis also serves as adjunct professor at the University of Maryland College Park and as at-large member of the Prince George County Maryland Board of Education, a graduate of Morehouse College and the Harvard Kennedy School. Curtis is the co-founder and CEO of Real Men Teach, a national campaign to recruit and retain educators, male educators of color. So please welcome on with me, Curtis Valentine. Curtis, welcome, welcome, brother. Hello, 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 hello. Peace, peace, peace. How you doing? Doing good, doing good. We are excited to have you on with us today. Rocking your real men teach gear. We love to see it. <laughs> love to see it. Let always, the people know where on, they always can on get brand. It. You gotta be on brand. Let the people know where they can get a little apparel at. Where can they go well, get that? It's super simple. Realmenteach.com. Uh, it will take you to our print to order service. Um, you know, you can pick pick different colors. Um, we have we have other um, hoodies and t-shirts that highlight. Uh, male educators in popular culture like Professor Dwayne Wayne and Furious Styles from from Boys in the Hood. Yeah, uh, and so yeah, get, 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 get your apparel today. Shout out to you, rocking it well, rocking it well. So always, we like to start off with hearing a little bit about our guests and their journey to be an educator. Can you share with us today what led you into the space of education? What inspired you to be an educator? Well, for me, you know, I'll say, and this is a, a recent discovery um, that, you know, I didn't I didn't choose education. Education chose me. Uh, I come from a long history of men and women in education, uh, going back to a man named John Chavis, who in the early 1800s became the first African-American in U.S. history to go to college in this country. Hmm. He eventually started a school in um, North Carolina that educated both black and white students. Uh, and I am part of that history. I'm also part of the history of my great grandparents, Beverly and Martha Valentine, who started a Rosenwald school uh, in Bracey, Virginia, that educated uh, future scientists and future mm -hmm. lawyers and future doctors and was part of a national campaign by Booker T. Washington and Julius uh, Rosenwald to create over 5,000 schools throughout the South. I'm also a part of the history of William Valentine, who was the headmaster of something called the Bordentown School in Bordentown, New Jersey which was the only all black public boarding school in the North, which was mm -hmm. eventually shut down when the uh, Brown versus Board of Education was brought in. And so I come to this space as an educator, someone who was touched by male educators uh, and growing up in public school system in Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, when I uh, finished at Morehouse, I eventually went off to South Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer and became an educator working in villages in post-apartheid South Africa, returned to the U.S., and became a school teacher right here in Prince George's County, Maryland, where I'm on the school board. But this idea of really wanting to be an educator comes from those who poured into me and me just wanting to, to pass that forward. And as I teach you know, at, at University of Maryland College Park and really push Real Men Teach, this is me giving back to those who've given so much to me. 
I mean, that's a dope story because you come from a legacy of black educators. Um, and a lot of times in our programs, that's what we're teaching, the legacy of black education. Um, and this is a long history and a long tradition of black folks teaching and teaching our own and being educators in the community. So that is amazing that you can attach and trace your lineage back to a long history of black educators. And then you kind of peruse past this part, but I think it's dope that you are an international educator, okay? Um, you went back out there and you was teaching in the motherland. So even to get back connected um, to Africa and then come back to America in the sense that international um, education. Did you see a large difference between American education and um, education on the, uh, on the motherland? There were similarities and differences, um, particularly, I think people are people wherever you go. Parents care about their children um, wherever you go. Um, mm -hmm. But in some cases, particularly in, on the continent, education as a means to um, you know, individual progress was, was particularly coming out of apartheid was not institutionalized. Uh, mm -hmm. You come back to the United States, obviously we, there are opportunities here to move throughout the ecosystems through, through education, but mm -hmm. to a lesser degree that we think that, you know, particularly those of other races in America have. And so, the, the racial divide in South Africa and the racial divide in America were quite similar. And so white South African students um, had a, a much different trajectory through the system than black South African students as it is here in the US. Uh, but just the system of, of parental engagement, system of you know black educators uh, really being at the forefront of the work is one of part of my vision for real men teaching what education looks like in America, which is you know people of color, people really um, ha having, you know, uh, control over their own destiny as it relates to educating their children. Dope. Amazing. Sad that even across the land, across the world, uh, race is still the major divider in who gets a quality education. That's super mm -hmm. sad. But talk to us about Real Men Teach. What is Real Men Teach? What's the goal of the organization? Well, Real Men Teach um, unofficially launched um, on December 1st of 2020. Um, and, you know, our story is we launched in the pandemic. Uh -huh. But, you know, as the old saying goes, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. And, you know, like my man Malcolm Gladwell says, take that 10,000 hours to really um, get good at something. And so technically Real Men Teach started uh, roughly eight years ago. Um, and this idea of the male educator network of Prince George's County, which was um, a program that I started as a school board member. When I joined the school board, um, being an educator at the time, I was the only um, person on the school board who actually taught in my school system. Wow. And I've been on the school board for eight years, and I'm still the only person on the school board who actually has taught in the school system in which I'm on the school board. And so I understood the, um, the impact that Black, you know, black male educators have had on, on students um, but also the power of community and support and the impact that could have on particularly um, retention of black male educators. And so I partnered uh, with Albert Lewis, who was the reigning um, teacher of the year in the county, a young African-American teacher. When I met him, he said, I'm a teacher of the year. I said, man, you you in your mid, you know, mid late 20s and you're the teacher of the year. I said, man, we should work together on trying to create more Albert Lewis's. Uh, and so partnering with him and my brother, Victorious Hall, who was also an educator. And so the three of us, along with, you know, other men throughout the district said, let's form a, you know, a form, an opportunity for us to come together, train one another in the skills we need to be successful uh, sort of in our positions, but also as we move up and through the, the career path. And so for roughly seven years, you know, we work to really, um, you know, support men of, men of color um, in education here in Prince George's County to the point where right now, um, our school district has the largest percentage of male educators and male educators of color in the entire DC metro area. And so this idea of what could happen in a district really gave me the idea for what could happen um, nationally. And so Real Men Teach is that campaign uh, to really highlight, um, you know, the success in, 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 of, of what it looks like to be um, a black male educator, how we reinvest, how we reimagine, all with the intention and goal to recruit and retain uh, more male educators of color. So you said <clears throat> so much right there. But one of the things that I found really interesting in what you said was that you are the only person on that school board who has taught in that school district. 
and I just find that amazing because you have people making decisions for a community or a school that they haven't, you know, had years of investment in. So again, shout out to you for wanting to, again, move up that ladder and invest in a community that you are a part of. We need more people doing things like that so we can have control and decision-making power and have seats at the table. So shout out to you. Um, so it sounds like Real Men Teach like really took off. <laughs> so it exploded, um, which shows us that there's a, there was a gap and there was a need and Real Men were, were making the decision to stand in it and fill that gap. Can you break down for us what you guys mean by real men? I think that that phrase is so like just used in community, right? Like you gotta be a real man. Real men do this. You know, I'm a real man. Okay, what well, what what is that, right? What is the concept of real men teach? No, I appreciate that. And again, I think for for those who have who have, who have you know purchased our apparel, who shared our information, who sort of really pushed us out. For many people, uh, the success of real men teach is in some way, the simplicity of the term, but also how loaded each term really is and how much of a discussion topic each term really is. And in many ways, how we um, are really trying to give back the power to individuals to define in their own terms what each word means. And so when we talk about the term real, we're really in this space of authenticity and allowing people to be their authentic self in spaces but also the power and impact that that could have on them as educators. Those who can walk into a teaching space, bring their knowledge of a particular content area or skill, but bring everything along with it and not just solely that skill or content area. And what the impact that would have on, particularly on their students and their permission um, and that you give your students to be their authentic selves mm. at the same time. And so it's a, and very much a win-win. And so when we say real, we say, you know what? Real is what real means to you. And as we talk about people defining what it means to be authentic in this space, whether you have to be sort of, um, you know, what it looks like, what it sounds like, um, what its sexual orientation is, what its gender is, what do you identify with, what your background is, whether you have a degree or not, uh, however you look, whatever real means to you is what you define. And so when you wear, when you support our gear, and this is for men, women and men who support our work, authenticity and realness is defined by, and you could shape it and not be really constricted by what real has meant in the past. And we often, you know, talk about real, but not also the word men. And the word men, again, we're having a conversation around um, gender identity and also just what it means to be a man. Um, and oftentimes we talk to talk to men, we say, you know, how do you define manhood? And oftentimes that Ooh. definition is based on what their father's that definition of manhood is, or their grandfather's, or their great-grandfather's, depending on the influence they had on their lives. But we say, we, we moving forward, we define what manhood means. Is, does manhood mean being you, you, you have to do something that, um, you know, may be a, a, a negative seen by some? Um, mm -hmm. Does it mean that, you know, you're doing things that give you a certain cachet in a certain community? Uh, but we say, with particular, you define uh, what, men, what men means, particularly in a profession like teaching, uh, that have, has, you know, has been, you know, um, femininized as, as far as this idea of like, yeah. you know, only women, women teach. Like, no, this is not something that is solely for women. We're saying that that manhood and being a teacher and an educator are synonymous. And lastly, the term teach. This idea that, you know, when we think about all the all those who influence um, our children on a daily basis, not only the instructors, but everyone who touches them from the, from the moment they open their eyes in the morning. From their father, from their grandfather, when they leave the house, that school bus driver, when they get off the bus, whether it be the security guard or the or the or the person who's the building supervisor, to the paraprofessional, to the person working in the lunchroom, to the football coach after after school, to the to the chess chess coach, all of those men in every capacity is a teacher. There's a, there's a picture that went viral a couple of years ago of a student who was sitting out in the hallway at a desk working on assignment. And there happened to be a security guard sitting at the desk with the student doing his homework. Hmm. It's this idea that the security guard was walking by, saw the student in the hallway, you know, and we can have a conversation about discipline and why the student was put out. But nevertheless, the, 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 you know, the security guard said, hey, what are you working on? I understand how to do that. Can I help you with that? Because he said, like, I, all, like, like we say is, it's a, all hands on deck. That's and right. so every man that we see 
um, that touches a child is a teacher in that space. And so those who wear our apparel make a statement that you don't have to be a classroom teacher. But if you're a father and you taught your child how to tie their shoes or ride their bike or uh, how to tie a tie in that space, you were a teacher. You were a bus driver and you were the first person in the morning that told that student you are amazing. You're great. You know, you know what you learned in school that day and you're imparting some knowledge onto them in that space. You are their teacher. If you're a security guard or the building supervisor or in every space you have to impart onto our young people, we are creating a village approach. And so real men teaches authenticity. It's defining who we are, but expanding this role of what it means to be a teacher in a time when we need all hands on deck. That's dope. And the reason why I like that concept and how it's just multi-layered, uh, I think it just sends a message beyond classroom teacher, but it's also very encouraging about what teaching means and what it means to be a teacher beyond book knowledge, right? Beyond all of those things. And I think that is great. Number one, telling people the whole real men, that, that really means you bringing your authentic self and who you are. Um, and how you define manhood, I think that that's amazing because I think a lot of times under the concept of real man, people don't get to be the, their authentic selves, especially when we think about our young boys and what's pushed into their heads about manhood. Um, a lot of them shy away from being their authentic selves in an attempt to fit onto a role or somebody else's idea of what a real man is. And we know those have so many negative consequences and effect on the psyche of our young men and then how they then act that out. So the concept of concept of being a real man and being your authentic self, I think is dope on the levels that you connected that on. And then let, 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 me, let me add one more thing. I, I think when it comes to those yep. who are coming yep. up, right, these Gen Z students who I think are redefining it really on their own. Yes. And it's a, a quick yes. example. So within our apparel, we have uh, pink hoodies. And, you know, when I, when I came up, you know, I think, you know, I give shout out to, to, to Killy Cameron and Dipset. Yeah, Killy Cam Cam. Yeah, yeah. Make, 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 making pink, you know, uh, you know, man, you know, manly. But before that, growing up, you know, mothers, fathers didn't put pink on their sons. Mm -hmm. That's not manly. Right. We don't do that. Even purple in some ways, you know. But we, these young people right now are saying, hold on. I, there are no boundaries to how I present myself, to what I wear, to who I am. And so if you want to you want me to go into this teaching, you're trying to recruit me to become a teacher. But you're saying I have to still live by these antiquated views of what it means to what I could wear, what I could dress, how I could present myself into the space. But well, I don't want to be there unless yeah. you can really appreciate me for who I am in 2021. But as someone who wears pink, you know, who wears jewelry, has earrings in my ear, have natural hair, all those things that I think a lot of us when we came up, um, really had to tuck in and sort of, you know, even unconsciously say, you know what, I'm going to respond to those things that people say are manly. Some of, you know, and many of them were not so positive. Right now, we want to introduce our young people into teaching. We have to create those spaces that meet them where they are and what their definitions of authenticity and manhood are. And you're opening up something that's so important that we talk about a lot on building a black educated pipeline, breaking down those barriers. Why do we create barriers for black people to be in the education field? Right. If they're dealing with enough financial barriers, all types of stuff. And then for us to come in and create these unconscious or these invisible barriers um, that keep folks, especially young people out of the profession, it's so important to begin breaking those walls down. A lot of times I talk to people about, the young people are the foundation of the pipeline. Uh, there will be nobody to recruit, teach, retain, or <laughs> or any of that stuff if we don't begin to start investing in our young people inside the pipeline. So again, having these conversations, creating campaigns that break down those barriers for our young people to feel welcome in this space, I think is dope. I think is super amazing. So appreciate that. Now, a lot your organization your organization talks a lot about. Um, recruitment and retention of black males, but I think what's dope and I don't hear a lot is this idea of reimagining and reinvesting. Um, I think that that doesn't get talked about enough and all four of those concepts aren't put together as like a strategic strategy. So can you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by reimagining and reinvesting um, in the pipeline or in black male educators? No, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, this idea of what society, um, what institutions believe it means to be 
um, a black and Latino male educator has to be challenged. When I became a school teacher, um, like a lot of black and brown men who become school teachers, everything that everyone thought a black and brown teacher should be was downloaded onto me or downloaded onto my brothers. Mm. Disciplinarian, um, you know, someone who's going to, we're going to send all the problem children to them. Mm -hmm. Like they're probably one of the few in the building, black, black or brown men in the building. And so all those things get downloaded onto you, um, even if you're not in the right position to, to address those things. And so it's incumbent upon everyone to say, all right, can we just throw out that old view of what it means to be a black and brown uh, male teacher and move forward with this new reimagination of what it looks like? But more importantly, that that is defined by black and brown male educators, that we define what it means to be, you know, from 2020 moving forward, uh, what that looks like. Because in many cases, the retention issues that we have is, you know, burnout. A brother saying, you know what, they, they came in and I, I wanted to do this and they had me doing this. And, and, and but where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Where does that view of what it means to be a black and brown educator come from? It comes from history. It comes from a lack of imagination. It comes from stereotypes. And so this reimagining and particularly um, our Real Men Teach 100 campaign, which is saying we are going to use images of black and brown men um, and allies from you know our white brothers who are allies in their natural state and saying, here's what it looks like. I'm defining it in my natural habitat to say, here are the images. And we understand the power of imagery going back to you know um, pre-emancipation, where people used imagery through photographs and eventually through videos and audios to shape views and stereotypes of particularly, particularly black and brown men in society. Mm. Those stereotypes carry through even into the education field and into teaching. And we're saying through our platforms and through the voices we have, we can redefine and shape that and reimagine the future of what it means to be a black and brown male educator. What does one look like? What does one talk like? What, what subject do they teach? We have, a, we have a shortage of particularly black and brown educators in the lower elementary classrooms mm -hmm. because there was a sense that, you know, even some parents who had, you know, someone who looked like me teaching kindergarten would push back. Why is he teaching kindergarten? Why is he teaching the little kids? You know, uh, you know, those things impact us. Mm -hmm. And if we're saying that we're going to just look at, you know, look at carry these old ways of stereotyping us that we're going to get the same result. And so this reimagining, which is, again, allowing us to speak out through our images um, and to define what it looks like is an incredibly important way to retain those who we bring in. Because if not, I think we're going to lose more than we bring in. I, I agree with you 100%. The typecasting of Black male teachers has to stop. Um, and one thing I learned from being around more Black male educators um, is they want to be recognized for what they do. Um, and that's way more than discipline. Just because they can connect with students on a cultural level, um, or students can relate to them. Black male educators can teach. They're quality educators. They can be your administrators. They can be your principals. They can be your great team leads. They can be your curriculum writers, all of those things. Uh, but we definitely need to reimagine a world where black men are leading and teaching. I agree with you 100%. I think a lot of times, and I've found, I've, I've been you know, acquainted with black men who have left organizations because they feel like they are being so typecast into a certain role. Um, you know, they're trying to move into roles of, and you know, instruction and folks are trying to tell them, oh, you'll be better suited here. And exactly what you said about black men being in the high school arena. Um, and, you know, there's a deeper thought process and connection for that because they want them there as a sense of, of control for black boys, so to speak. Right. Because we all know that the population um, for teaching is heavily populated with white women. Um, so they want them there, you know. I dare I say, as a, as a scare tactic or, or, or a token piece. Uh, who these Black boys need somebody to relate to? They do. Um, but young children also need to see positive images of Black men. Young children also need to develop positive classroom relationships with Black men. Again, mm -hmm. you know, we plant seeds in kids' heads from the time they're born. So imagine kindergartners and first graders having these positive relationships and seeing Black male teachers. That's the age where what most kids are talking about I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a policeman, right? All those great things. So imagine you're a teacher, a black male teacher. I want to be like Mr. Valentine. Like I want to be him. 
So all yeah. of those things are, are yeah, really and, and, and I, I, I think I'll, I mean to cut you off, but you know, yep. I, I asked those to do an experiment, right? Sit mm-hmm. down with some high school students and say, you know, close your eyes and imagine a male teacher. Like, what does that person look like? You know, when you and I came mm-hmm. up, it was not someone who had any swag. Right? Had no cool, had no coolness. Glasses was with the nobody, button. Okay. Nobody I want, nobody I wanted to be with. Didn't listen, didn't listen to your music. Didn't identify with you. Wasn't from your community, or so we thought. You never know. That person could have been from your very community, but the signals they were getting was you can't bring your Bronxness into right. this classroom. Like you can't bring your Gun Hillness into here. Be, and you're like, hold up, but, but I'm from the community. I know that, but you can't dress like this in class because this is not how black male teachers dress. Yes. And what you're doing is creating these barriers because the very thing those students were looking for was, was who you were in your authentic self. And this is not sort of like we have to really change who you are. I say just present who you are, yeah. how you are to your students. Because in the end, it's really about the students. And we talk about, you know, um, this idea of what it the what, uh, you know, my, my my good brother Chris Emden um, just published a book called, you know, Ratchetdemic, this idea of what it means to be ratchet. But at the same time, <laughs> our young people in our communities, how we see them and what we define as, you know, our growing skill that they had to have to adapt to the community in which they, the, you know, they lived in. And so whether it be how you and I, we talk with our hands, like yeah. I talk with my hands. Mm-hmm. And if you told me, Curtis, Put your hands in your pockets and do this whole interview. We have a problem, right? <laughs> but, but that because where I'm from in New Jersey, people did this, and I'm kind of talking to emphasize, but also to kind of like you know create a space for me to tell my story, especially when we, we do like five people trying to talk at the same time. And yes. guess what? I also learned to talk fast because <laughs> I had to get my piece in before Shayna got her piece in, yes. and so well, Curtis. I talk so fast. Well, that, I'm a I'm a product of my environment yes. of growing up. In New, now, if you're from Georgia, Alabama, maybe you talk slower. No, no better or worse. But when we don't bring ourselves to this space, we are not giving students the opportunity to bring themselves. And in many ways, we're not giving op- opening avenues for them to say, wow, my authentic self can also be presented in a way that I'm the educator. I'm at the front of the room. I'm leading the way. Because if you never see anyone who looks like you in leadership, you're unconsciously signaling that who you are is not worthy of leadership or of elevation. And so through our Real Men Teach 100 campaign is we put our people at the forefront and their authentic selves saying, you know what, we are who we celebrate and we celebrate us in our authentic spaces, reimagining what it means to be an educator so that those who come behind us feel like they are uh, accepted in those spaces. Yes. And I'm laughing in my mind because when you said like, when you imagine a black male teacher, what would they look like, right? I think about some of my experiences uh, with young black male teachers on dress down day and how the how amazed the kids <laughs> are when these brothers come in, right? With their true swag, like, yo dog, you wearing Tim's? Yeah, they, I mean, they real people. <laughs> they real why, people. Why not every day though, why not? So this idea, like, so we have people, we have people, we have educators who on the weekends, they like their sneaker heads, so they wear their they got every pair of Jordans. They like comic books, so they go to Comic Con and they're you know, or yeah. they play in a go go band, or they're or they, or they are they freestyle. Those, but it's, it's, and so they're saying, you know what? I'm not going to bring it into the classroom because you know that's my personal life and that's not what teachers do. And in your classroom, the very thing that student you're trying to get through to yeah. could have also an interest in comic books in Jordans in music, in visual arts. And what you're doing is tucking in all that. Mm-hmm. And you're at the same time creating a barrier yes. for you to connect with those very students who are waiting and are looking for permission to be themselves. And you are right there and God <laughs> put you all together. And yet the, the systems, and in many ways, other educators, what it could be some white women, some black women, who are telling us, no, this is not how we do this here. And that's based on everything in the past. Yes. And saying, well, no, can we rethink this? Can we reimagine this for the betterment of the children and for the retention of the male educator? Yes. And I haven't read that book. Was it Ratchetonomics? But... Ratchetonomics. Ratchetonomics. 
Yeah, it's so like ratchet, ac- ratchet academics, this idea of, you know, us being our authentic selves before our children, because, you know, you know, Chris talks about how in the classroom, the students will respond to math in a certain way. But during recess, he'd look outside and he'd see them freestyling. And the freestyle circle, they were like exuberant. They were all excited. He's like, well, how come I can get, get that excitement from the recess and the excitement of the freestyling into my classroom? Well, I have to meet my students where they are, not reject their authentic selves, which is, again, a product of their environment, and also understand that if it's really about the students, I need to meet them where they are, and me- who I bring into the classroom has an impact on who they bring to the classroom as well. And I think sometimes with students, well, not sometimes, all the time, if you know students, if you work with students, especially Black students, students love when you bring your authentic and your true self to the classroom, no matter who you are. And they respond to that. So I'm even thinking about just for Black men, the power of being your authentic self, the power of speaking your authentic language, (laughs) right, at times to kids. So you teaching math, what is this throw a little like, all right, boom, so this is what we're going to do, right? Kids are going to (laughs) respond to that because that's that's their language that's their group that's what they're attracted to and that's like you know mr so he, he mad cool right like that's when you get that um but this idea that you can't be ratchet and academic um it's just unheard of that's yeah. like almost telling kids like you can't outside of school like you, we're straight lace and we don't party we do like we're real human authentic people that children can actually relate to you know what i mean and but, understand but but why would i want to be like you if you're all <laughs> stuffy yeah. and like, and that ain't the like I'm you're, saying, to live. you're saying, don't you want to be a teacher too? Like you? Yes. Nah, nah, like, I'm good. Or, or what I think we, you know, and what you all are doing, this, what the center is doing is we tell people, educators, particularly those who are trying to meet, you know, as early as you all are, is you know what? Nah, you could be a teacher in in the way you want to be. We we throw out all that, and you yeah. bring who you want to be, and this is important because. You know what I've done with my with 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 my work. Um, you know, in Maryland, Maryland, my students. We were we were all, we were virtual mm-hmm. for a long time, and I would intro. My students were coming in, and I'm playing BMX. I'm playing Talib. I'm playing, and you know, and they're coming in. They're like, "Where my dogs at?" Oh my god! <laughs> and I'm coming. In, yes, I, how you doing, Curtis Valentine, Professor Valentine? Then we're gonna talk about. This. They were like, "We." we but I'm still with the business. Yes. But I'm gonna tell you, if y'all were not here and in my office, I'm listening to DMX. I'm right. listening to Mob Deep. I'm listening to I'm listening to Fela Cootie. I'm listening. I'm listening mm-hmm. to the different people. But you are gonna get this. And, and my man Loaded Luck said, you are gonna get this work. And I, I, I listen to battle rap. Like I can I can listen to battle rap, but also turn on C-SPAN. Right. I can listen to NPR radio and and listen to verses. That's who I am. In my totality. Yes. But if we're saying as an educator, we only want this piece of you. We only want the and NPR and not the verse. It's pro- very problematic. Very problematic to, again, when you think about culturally who we are as a people, we're not monolithic, um, but we're not even monolithic in a solo sense. Like we is so many different avenues that we span from. And it is, it is oppressive and it is not inviting when you can't bring your authentic self and all of who you are to a space. And it's funny, right? It, it's like this, this sense of, oh, if I let you bring a little bit of the outside, you're not gonna know how to be appropriate with it, right? <laughs> Just a smack in the face to grown people um, who are here living and working. But in like, we can't show children how to do both, right? Like we don't have that power to show children but, how but, to do but, both. But, but Shana, all our, I mean, so this is, I mean, I don't wanna get off topic, but our, our black church- We're on top, we always on topic. <laughs> yeah. but, but I would say the black church has a similar issue. Mm-hmm. This idea that we want to keep the world outside of the church, because if the world comes into the church, that the church will become the world. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's that's it's it's literally the opposite. You have to meet the world where it is, because, you know, this idea of, again, this judgment and this rejection of authenticity is the one, again, real men teach says, you know, I redeclare it. This is mine and I control yeah. it. Uh, and you go, and, and and the students are going to see it, and they're going to say, you know what? I want, I want that power. I want that power. I'm down for that. I'm willing to jump in with y'all. Let's do it. Yes. So one of the things that you're doing with Roman Teach, very similar to what we're doing at the center, is building a network of people, building institutions, 
to fight institutions who are creating these concepts of, of how we act or, or what we should be. So like even the example of the church, there's a concept of created of how you should be a Christian or how you should be whoever in a church. Then you think about like, who created this, right? Like who created these boundaries, who created these barriers? And then when you get like really deep rooted in it, right? A lot of this is rooted in white supremacies and um, power and control, right? People want to control and always police black people, black bodies, those kind of things. So when you start to reject those notions and understand like I can be a professional, I can be what I want to be and still be my authentic self and still be appropriate. Like you find a lot of power in that. And I think what you're doing with room and teaching, what we're doing at the center is building institu institutions that celebrate that, that break down those barriers and allow people to be exactly who they are um, and respond, right? Culturally, culturally responsive, right? Respond culturally to people. And I think that that's, that's great work. Um, but something that's really unique about you, right? So in addition to Real Men Teach. You also work at the Progressive Policy Institute for Reinventing American Schools. You're a professor at the University of Maryland. How do all three of those experiences influence your quest for teacher diversity? Well, it's it's based on systems. And so at, at Reinventing American Schools, uh, our goal is to work at the system level through superintendents and school board members to really look at how school systems are governed. And we really stand on, on sort of three pillars. One is this idea of autonomy, which is how do you give school leaders more power to make decisions over hiring and targeting particular underrepresented groups? And so in many cases, our, our really quest to um, really grow the level of autonomy that school leaders have, and um, in many cases, those school leaders wanna have a little more autonomy, particularly in a charter school, or in some cases called innovation schools. These are schools that you'll see in places like um, Camden, New Jersey. You'll see in school places like Indianapolis and Denver, where you're saying we're going to give the school leader more autonomy to make you know make hiring decisions, um, and so that's going to lead to more power and autonomy to choose and target particularly male educators of of color. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know that push, and we've worked in you know 15, 20 different districts around the country. And I'm working with different school leaders um, and, 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 fellow school, and fellow school board members from around the country. That is incredibly important um, for me to, to talk to my colleagues who are also on school boards, talk about their policies around recruitment and retention, to tell about what we're doing in Prince George's County, targeting even now more Latinx uh, brothers into teaching. Uh, at the same time, you know, at the University of Maryland, you know, I'm one of the few black male professors that my students have, have ever had. And I'm coming to that space again, understanding the power and the influence I have, not only on, on black students, but also on white students, that they understand and they could graduate from college saying, I too had a black male professor and his name was Professor Valentine and this is who he was, both masters from Harvard, everything else, but came to class in his authentic self. And so we're gonna give permission to even some of our white brothers and sisters to be themselves because they also live in a space where they have to sort of respond to certain caricatures of what it means to be who they are. I'm also on the faculty senate subcommittee on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion at University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. We have a, a black male president for the first time in the school's history who's going to dedicate $40 million to teacher diversity at the higher ed level. And Come so on, every, yeah. every, every <laughs> teach, you know, we want to partner with uh, we want to partner with higher ed folks in this space. How are we working with um, higher ed to create pipelines of black and brown male educators, not only in K-12, but also in um, in higher ed as well, because when we're talking about the teacher training that Sharif talks a lot about in your center, a lot of it's going to be who are teaching our young people how to be educators. How to be educators. And that's going to happen. In, that's that's going to happen with our um, with our professors. Yep. And that's what my next question. I mean, you 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 kind of answered it, but I would love to hear more about how it works in school of education because there's a lot of focus in K-12 education on teacher diversity, but there is a strong lack of teacher diversity in schools of education around the world. But why is it important that we do focus on diversity um, in schools of education? You already named one really important point because it's important for us to understand who is teaching our future teachers. Um, but what are some other benefits you see by diversifying schools of education around the country? Well, I mean, I think when we're in, in some of the universities that have approached us, and you know, I mean, we're, we've been in such a place where we've had universities unsolicitedly just say, hey, you know, we're trying to 
bring more high school students to apply to our university, particularly our School of Education. We have students who are on campus who are studying other topics, engineering, math, you know, law, and we're trying to get them to take courses at our ed school because maybe they want to take their skill in science and math or in literature and apply it to teaching. And so they understand the power of what we call community. When you're, when you're in a classroom and you have someone who looks like you in a community, others who look like you, likely that you want to stay in that profession and want to, you know, um, continue to study that major is increased. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you come into a classroom and you see someone who looks like me and, and, and some of my colleagues in front of the classroom, you're going to say, okay, you know, this is something I, I can get down with. And you look on the syllabus and you see ta Coates and, and James Baldwin and others. Like, oh, now I'm seeing myself even in the readings because prior to that, I was not. And then when it comes specifically to the teaching profession, this idea of cultural competency, this idea of un un ensuring that, you know, we are teaching how to be anti-racist even in even before they get into the classroom, because oftentimes we sort of say, you know what, we'll take you as you are and we'll, you know, we'll do sort of press the development sessions every once in a while, you know, we'll bring up the speed. We don't have to do that. If we can diversify our higher ed space and bring more black and brown brothers into the teaching space, we could prepare our folks to be ready on day one mm -hmm. to teach in spaces that allow for our students to be authentic and also to meet them where they are and have to deal with a lot of the issues that have to be sort of, uh, you know, take sort of uh, addressed once they get into the classroom because they've been sort of um, uh, have issues at higher ed and what's taught and, mm -hmm. um, and those things. So I, I think there's, there's power there. I, I agree with you 100%. And I think the same benefits that we talk about that exist in K-12 uh, for black, black students having a black teacher, those same, um, if not a little bit more powerful for white students um, exist um, in the higher ed. Because if you look at schools of education all around the world, right, it, they're mostly populated by white students, right, white, white female students who have probably never even had contact or had a black teacher through their whole experience. So at least, at least in, at the university level, right? They're going to see or have a black professor if we diversify that population. And like you already hinted on, giving a whole entire different perspective and not having to wait till you get to your actual job to get this training on um, diversity and inclusion or cultural competency. So having that be a real experience um, in the School of Education is super, super important. What would you say are some of the challenges that Black men are facing with breaking into the education profession? We already talked about some of the social challenges of not being their authentic selves. Um, are there some others that you see or Black men have uh, have quoted or said to you? Well, a um, couple of things. Let me say, you know, there, there's an old saying, um, not an old saying, Dr. King once said, you know, uh, as we were talking, as we were going through the civil rights movement and these conversations around integration, um, and he said, you know what, you know, just where America is going, I'm fearful that we're integrating into a burning building, mm. meaning we, we want to be accepted by a community that in, all, in and of itself is not um, not healthy mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about particularly black male educated and us really wanted to say we want to increase and we want to recruit, recruit, recruit. I am concerned that a lot of the spaces that we're recruiting into are not ready for our brothers. And this gets to this piece I mentioned before because of all the stereotypes and the lack of imagination. And so if we're not creating these spaces, not after they get there, but before they get there, we're going to lose again more than we bring in. And so we have to sort of say, who, who's going ahead of us and making mm. a space for us and making a way for us so that when we, when we land, that there is support, there is affirmation, there is community. And that is an issue I think we, we already have now because those who us have gone and have told our stories about when we walked in in the first year or two, really trying to sort of, again, define who we are and having to do it year after year after year to the point where so, so many end up leaving, that that is incredible. That, that, that's an issue. I mean, yeah. if you want to sort of get into pipeline issues, I mean, <laughs> if, 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 if you're talking about particularly, again, the images and the ideas of what it means to be an educator, we have to, again, uh, understand what that means. If I remember my own experiences, and I had some positive experiences, and I had some negative experiences. And I wasn't someone who went directly into education or decided in college I wanted to be an educator. 
Mm-hmm. Um, because of, again, first how the profession was viewed in society, my own personal experience and the like. And so it also has to be a societal, societal village level elevation of the profession. And again, through Real Men Teach and, our, and again, our continued um, positive imagery through our Real Men Teach 100 campaign is saying, we're going to put the teaching profession in your face every single day. And when we talk about normalize normalize it, like, wow, this guy Curtis is posting about another black and brown educator who's killing it. Oh, man. All right, Kurt, we get it. We get it, bro. (laughs) This stop. Like, no, no, no. This is what normalize means. Normalize means it becomes so normal that it's not a it's it's not a it's not a holiday to see, you know, a black or brown male educator doing amazing. So that when you go in to the classroom, you give that person the same level of respect you give your doctor or your lawyer or your accountant or your CEO because we've elevated the profession and mm-hmm. we've said no this profession um takes skill takes time that's something you just sort of fall into but deserve the respect because of everything it takes to become this but also what it gives to society and what it gives to our students and a path it lays for every other profession and so again that societal sort of acceptance and elevation of the profession but also this going ahead uh, and ensuring that when we're we're placing our young people, particularly our young men of color in schools, that that environment is an enabling environment for them to be real, for them to exude their manhood, and, all, and also for them to um, be their authentic selves as they are teaching and teaching a way that allows them to bring it, bring that subject matter to the students and meet the students where they are. Yeah, we've talked a lot about that in terms of recruitment and retention, um, and how recruitment and retention go hand in hand and we can recruit all the young brothers in the world. But if they, we put them somewhere where they don't feel welcome, they don't feel supported. They don't feel like they're going to be developed. We know they'll leave the profession within two years. The statistics say two to three years, they will Mm -hmm. be gone. They will have left. Um, So we started to have this idea about preparing leaders to be able to lead and support um, and mentor. Um, young black men that are coming into the profession because we're not, we're going to continue to have the leaky pipeline, right? We're going to have all this healthy recruitment of getting people excited to be in the field. And then once they get in the field, they're like, hold up, <laughs> this is not what y'all told me was about to be. I didn't know I would have these extra hurdles and these extra uh, struggles to have to endure in order just to teach some black children. So, and, 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 and so to your, so through our campaign, so this week or so ago, um, we did a um, women for real men teach uh, campaign, and they were like, like, you know, Latina. We had we had white, we had black women, because we said, well, you know what? If the majority of the school principals and school leaders are in the country are women, some white, some Latina, some black, and they're not down with the campaign, and you know, and they have the, and they're having the power to make the decisions. And Curtis, yeah. you on one side of the, you know, with 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 your real with the reinventing America schools project, saying give the power to the principal to make a decision. And the principal doesn't believe in these three words, and yep. the principal doesn't believe in the power of diversity. Then we we spin in our heads, and so we're saying we have to elevate not only you know our class brothers who are going into the teaching, we have to elevate school leaders in our campaign. We have to have them buy in and declare it and and declare to the world what they stand for. We have to have women, white women, Latina, Asian, Black, all women saying, you know, Curtis. Uh, and I, I, I guess ask all the hey Curtis, I ask all the time, Curtis. Well, you know, I'm a woman. You know, can I wear a real men teach shirt? Yes. I, I said, let me ask you a question. Can a black man wear a black girl's rock shirt? Absolutely. Yes. My daughter, I wear it for my, I wear it for every everyone in my, because I believe it. You can wear this too, because you are also declaring and saying, I stand with this, even though I am not a man. I am someone who stands, even though I'm not a man of color. We have some of our white male allies who said, Kurt, man, I'm a white male school leader, but I want more diversity too. Can I wear a shirt? Please do. Please tell your 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 black and brown male educators in your building, fellas, I see you. Um, I'm I'm here to push this push this campaign because I understand the power of it. And to my student and to your black and brown students, you go to them and say, hey, I'm wearing this for you. Because yeah. I understand, I know the power that you that it has for you to see people who look like you, even though I'm not one. I have to make the decision as well. And that is how you become part of our campaign. We have people who were highlighting, but we also have allies as well. Creating a village, creating a coalition to support these black men to get into the teacher pipeline. I mean, I love it. 
I love it because you need that. You need a coalition. We need the village, right? We need the village to help young black men understand that teaching is revolutionary um, and that real men yeah. teach without a doubt. So some folks it's, might be watching this and thinking to themselves like, wow, this is powerful. This is great. But what does an equitable teaching environment look like for black teachers? Like, how do I create an equitable teaching environment in my school if I, if I have black men there or I'm looking to recruit them? Well, I mean, again, let's, let's define the term correctly. Equity and, um, you know, equality are two different things, yep. right? Equity says I'm going to target certain, you know, resources in the space where they're most needed. And so to me, it's about percentages. If you have 80% of your students in your, in, in your school building are students of color or particularly black, you know, uh, black Latino male educated students, we need to ensure that there's equity in the number of teachers who look like them and have a similar experience. We want to target and give those who need the most the most. And that means people who understand their background, understand how, you know, how to communicate, um, know, know how to um, de-escalate, know how to bring who they are into the curriculum, how to bring their community and who they are uh, into the work so that they see themselves in the work that they're doing. And it's not a foreign concept. And mm -hmm. so this idea of really being targeted, that's something that school leaders should do. But more importantly, my school board colleagues and other, you know, leaders around the country who are saying, you know, I really care about, you know, you know educational equity. What is your policy on education as it relates to human resource development and ensuring that those students who, who need the most are getting the most? And how are you ensuring that you are empowering the school leaders to have the decision making process to, uh, re again, resource, highlight, train and put those folks in the classrooms that they, that, you know, in front of the students who need the most work. And so to me, it's about policy, it's about implementation, and it's about giving those school leaders the power to make those decisions at the local level. Definitely. I think that that definitely feeds into creating equitable env environments for students and for teachers. Um, so we are going to go into, I think, a Black teacher segment. We're going to roll into that right now. So, Kurt, I want to give you the floor um, just because we're looking at you and the amazing work you're doing and you're so powerful. But I'm pretty sure that you have had plenty of influences in your life. So I'd like to give you the floor and the opportunity to thank a black teacher right now that has been a powerful inspiration to you. Well, in, in the spirit of real men teach as defining, redefining what teacher is, you know, the first person I think is my father, um, who was my first teacher. Um, who was, you know, my first emulation of what it meant to be a man, a black man, a father, a husband. Uh, and so he taught me most everything I knew. Uh, but eventually before his death, you know, with my mother, um, uh, started in business of early child development and started early child development schools in New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, and really poured into the future of my community and ensuring that they had a head start through early child development. Second person is, is my middle school principal, uh, Carl Wade who um, even to this day is a champion of mine who works with us in this space, who when I first started Real Men Teach, brought 15 hoodies and handed them out to all educators in his field. Uh, he's someone at a very young age who showed me this is what it means to be a black male educator, but a leader, being that school principal, walking around, getting the respect of the community of parents. I wanted to be that. And lastly, my professor from, um, from graduate school, Charles Ogletree, um, who's someone who is a you know a historic figure from Harvard Law School? Um, he taught me really this idea, the idea of um, you know the power of race and justice, and the, more importantly, our obligation to the world and to our students. And more importantly, you know what he did? He gave me his cell phone, and he said, "Kurt, if you ever get pulled over by a cop, you call me." This is someone who taught President mm -hmm. Obama, who when you know Henry Louis Gates got arrested, was someone who called. He has taught so many amazing men from Harvard Law School but he gave all of his students his cell phone. And that was a power. That was the power of saying, I'm, I can be your educator, but when you leave this space, there's a world out there that I'm trying to prepare you for, but also to protect you from it. And so that mm -hmm. protection he gave his students to this day is someone who I, I really you know, appreciate. So it's Charles Ogletree, it's Carl Wade, and it's my, my late father, Curtis Valentine. I think that's amazing. And the fact that those are three black men in your lives, who have been a positive influence 
on you. So I encourage other black male educators out there to uh, be that light in a brother and a sister's life. Be that. And always my folks watching, it's that time for you to put in the chat, hashtag think a black teacher. So think a black teacher, if they're on Facebook, tag them. If they're not, but just put their names in the chat. Think a black teacher. We don't give folks their roses, their praises or any of that enough. And um, a lot of times I just think that, that as black teachers or folks teaching in a profession, you don't understand or realize the impact that you are really making on a person's life. I'm pretty sure that folks names get called out all the time. And like me, I did that. Like I was just being me. <laughs> like I was just doing what I do, teaching how I teach. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you're in it so much and you're in the thick of it. It can just really seem like a job. Right. The monotony of it, but knowing the influence and the impact that you're making on someone's life, I think that's also a major uh, retention point. <laughs> it makes people want to go back and be in a profession when they know that they are truly making a difference. So if you are out there, even if you think this person last week, thank them again. Hashtag thank a black teacher and write that person's name that you're thinking. Also, I also encourage folks, the teacher doesn't have to be your teacher. A lot of us watching and participating in this show are in education and have colleagues who we feel like are amazing and don't get their praise and don't get their just due. So if you know somebody out there doing a thing as a teacher and really making an impact in students' lives, making an impact in the community, make sure that you are thanking them. Um, we need folks out here. We need more Black teachers out here in the field. Um. Kurt, one last thing I really want to hone on, hone in on, because I think that this is super important as well to talk about. Um, and it has a lot to do with you being on the school board. And the reason why that's important for me to highlight before we leave off here, because you are a parent. And a lot of time parents don't have a seat at the table um, to make decisions at, at districts that the children in their community go to. Um, can you discuss a little bit how you're able to influence policy and strategy to increase the numbers uh, within that district? Well, in addition to being the only uh, member of the school board who taught my district at the time, when I joined the school board, I was the only person who had a child in the school system as well. Mm. I was the only parent in the system at the time. And that was an issue for folks in the community. And that was really a target for folks saying, we need someone on the school board who's a parent, who understands it. And so my children are still in the system. I mean, my children are 13 and 11. You know, I started on the school board when they were three and five. Still um, and so- you know, when they come home from school, you know, when we're having dinner, we are talking about the very policies that I'm, you know, voting on and, and very um, issues I'm funding. And they're, you know, really showing me, you know, dad, you thought this was what it's going to be when you envisioned it and when you voted for it and when they show you the data and they brought in some model. Here's what it looks like on the ground. At the same time, my wife is a, is a, is a principal. And so, when it comes to policy, it's coming from the policymaker, the superintendent, to all those who carry it out, to the, to the school leader and to the students. And so there oftentimes there's disconnects from policy to practice and throughout the pipeline and throughout, throughout the system. And so to have someone like a wife who's able to talk to me and really explain to me where policy and practice intersect and where they dissect, and having students to be able to respond back to me on a daily basis. My children are telling me, Dad, I like the school lunches. <laughs> who, who, who'd you all sign a contract with? You know, or dad, how come we don't have this in our building? And I'm like, okay, let me think about that. Is our, is, is your experience the same as everyone else in the system? We got, mm. we got 135,000 students. If mm. you are feeling this, what about the other 134, 800, you know? And so this is important. Having parents on the school board, are people going to give you an immediate reaction to what policy looks like on the ground? And so this is incredibly important. I take it very seriously that when I'm, talking with parents. And when I started something called the Fatherhood Forum, which is really increasing fatherhood engagement, mm -hmm. this is something that I wanted to target because I understood that fathers didn't have as much voice as I thought they should. Mm. So this parent engagement, particularly fathers, is incredibly important. So we appreciate, like, I mean, again, I think that is super important to highlight that because, you know, CEO of Real Men Teach, college professor, but first and foremost, at the heart of this, you are a parent, you are a dad, <laughs> you are a family man. Um, so to be in spaces where you can have influence in the type of education that your, your children are getting and be a decision maker in that, so all our folks out there listening, that's super important um, because policymakers are the one that, ones that make change um, in tons of places. So Curtis, we are about to wrap up. 
So I just want to give you the floor real quick to say some final words to our folks watching out there. No, thank you so much for highlighting me. Thank you, Shannon, for all you do. Thank you to Sharif and 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 the center. Um, out in like this, you know, you never know what impact you'll have on people um, when you start something. And so the responses we get on a daily basis for real men teachers so powerful. Um, and one in particular, I was talking with a brother and he said, Curtis, man, you know, I'm just so glad we met. It's, it's just, he says, finding out what you do and real men teach. You know what? I think I found my tribe. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? He says, man, because I've been doing this work for years, kind of on my own. But when I find others who are doing similar work and they connect with you, it's like I've, it's like I've been searching through the wilderness for this connection. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to connect. And so there are thousands of men and women, others who are standing for this very statement of diversity, you know, particularly of, of educators of color and are looking for connection and are looking to join the community. So join the Real Men Teach community. Join our tribe. Come connect with us at realmenteach.com. You don't have to do this on your own. You don't have to, you know, be that one person in your school, your district doing this work. Connect with us for this national movement because Real Men Teach and the center and others are connecting on this community and this tribe of folks really pushing this. And so, again, go to realmenteach.com, purchase some of our apparel. Proceeds go to our scholarship to make sure that black male educators, Latino educators can stay in the classroom to scholarships, but also support our, our Real Men Teach 100 campaigns. Like, share, let's normalize excellence and what it means to be an authentic, a real man in a teaching profession. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you again. Much appreciated. We appreciate you coming on the show and spreading the word of our real men teach and what it means to be your authentic self in the classroom. As always, our folks out there watching, my co-conspirators, we thank you for coming back every week and watching Building a Black Educator Pipeline. We'll see you next Thursday right here, same time, 12 noon. Have a great weekend.